yeah, I think we'll wait half a minute and we'll really jump in. Serious stuff. What's my recipe for chocolate? <laughs> Can you hear a joke? Yeah, I'll tell you a joke. Someone wrote in the chat, they want to hear a joke. Uh, back in Soviet Russia, a guy calls up the KGB, answer the phone. Hello, KGB. He says, yeah, KGB, tell me a joke. So the KGB officer says, okay, what's your address? He says, tells him his address. And uh, a minute later, there's a knock at the door. He opens the door, KGB standing there, they grab the guy and they take him to prison and they send him to Siberia for 20 years. 20 years later, a guy gets out of jail. <clears throat> he gets on the phone, first day of freedom. He calls up the KGB. KGB answers, hi, KGB. He says, yeah, KGB, tell me a joke. They say, sure. What's your address? He says, mm, I know that joke already. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, maybe it has a tie-in, by the way, to tonight's theme. I made a bracha before we started, by the way. Um, you know, the insanity of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, maybe that's the, the tie-in. Anyway, we are... Uh, we're going to talk about how to work on yourself. Part two. <laughs> a lot of questions. A lot of questions came in. Uh, and I want to get to, I don't think I'm going to get to all of them. I know I'm not going to get to all of them. But uh, I'm going to get to some of them. And then maybe <clears throat> after I do the questions that came in on the email, I will uh, try to do some questions, uh, live questions here. Um, okay, so let's start like this. I'm going to open up a, uh, a document I made for myself here of some of the questions that came in. Um, oh, this was fantastic. Actually, this wasn't even a question. This was just somebody offered me an insight, which I really, really cherish when people offer me insight. Dear Rabbi Taub, last night you shared the parable of the two sober alcoholics. One would drink if told by God, another wouldn't. By the way, it wasn't simply a parable. It was a real thing. I actually saw this conversation. So I, I it's also a, a, I guess that there's a lesson to it, but it's not a parable. It's an actual thing. I saw that. I, I saw it. Okay. We need to be ready for cha to change direction as soon as we're told. This is the person writing to me how they're paraphrasing the moral of that story. We need to be ready to change direction as soon as we're told. But if not told, we are to con continue in our mission. Yes, very good. Yes, I like how you paraphrased the point of that story. And today's daily wisdom of the Rebbe contains, I think, that same message. I think when they say the daily wisdom of the Rebbe, they're referring to a, maybe it's an email that goes out. I think that's what it is, an email that goes out with some teachings from uh, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Okay, and so they included here this teaching from the Rebbe, and it's actually connected to um, the Parsha this week, the, the Torah portion. Okay, uh, it says in English here, it's a translation of Exodus 15.22, Moses had to forcibly make the Israelites set out from the Sea of Reeds. Uh, what's this describing? Basically, after the uh, splitting of the sea, the miracle of the splitting of the sea. So Meshur no Moses had to actually, you know, force the Jews. Come on, let's go, giddy up, you know, let's, let's move. So here's the Rebbe's teaching that this person sent me. Beautiful. Um, the Jewish people, oh, I should mention, what were they doing? They were picking up the jewels that were washing up on the shore, the jewels from the uh, the, wa the wagons of the, the Egyptian army, the chariots. Okay, the Jewish people did not tarry out of greed, meaning they weren't like hanging out on the beach because they wanted to get all the jewels. 
well, they were getting all the jewels, but they weren't doing it out of greed. They were fulfilling God's commandment to empty Egypt of its wealth. See, before they left Egypt, they were given a commandment to leave with all of the wealth of Egypt, <clears throat> to take the basically the wealth, the material wealth, which represents the spiritual wealth, and to transfer it from the evil of Egypt to the holiness that Basically, they would ultimately use that wealth to build a, uh, a the, the Mishkan, the sanctuary in the desert. Okay, so they had a, they had this commandment to take the wealth out of Egypt. So, uh, and it says here, the spiritual dimension of this directive was to salvage all the potentials of holiness present in this wealth. From this, we learn. Once we know what our divine mission in life is, we must be so devoted to it that doing anything else seems unthinkable. Right, so the Jews were told, "Get all the wealth out of Egypt." All right, fine, no problem. And once they heard that, it's like single-minded. Get all the wealth out of Egypt. That's it. That's all we're going to do, and 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 you have to be that way. Once you know your mission, that's it. There's nothing else. On the other hand, get ready for the paradox, because everything in Judaism is always paradox. Whenever you say, "Is it A or is it B?" It's always C, right? That's why I'm a Gemini. I was born in Sivan, because and, and the Torah was given in Sivan. Because it's always, you know, the question of, uh, you know, is it this way or that way? It's both, right? That's 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 always paradox. Or like my uh, ancestor, the Megala Amukes, said that uh, the Kabbalist, the Megala Amukes, he said that Moshe is Rosh Hashanah's Machlekes Shamei Hillel. The name Moshe, Mo Moses, is an acronym for the disputes of Hillel and Shammai. In other words, the point is that. It, Torah is not, it's not, the, the, the fact that we have conflict in, in Torah is not, a, is, not a, is not a bug, it's a feature, right? So here comes the paradox. So on one hand, you have a mission, that's it. Anything else is unthinkable. So the Jews were told, you have, to, you have to sap Egypt of its wealth, that's it. So that's all we're doing. And they were singularly focused on that. On the other hand, as soon as, it, as soon as it is clear that it is time to change direction, we must not hesitate, right? Moshe was telling him, come on, no, we're done with that. I know it, before we were sapping Egypt of its wealth, but now the time for that's finished. Let's get along. We should apply ourselves to our new mission with the same enthusiasm we gave to our previous mission. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, <laughs> and I think the person who... who sent me that, it's just beautiful. I think there's so much there to be uh, expounded upon. Um, you know, we were speaking about last night that ultimately self-improvement is not something I do for myself. It's something I do for Hashem. And I do it to please Him. And because I'm doing it for Him and for His pleasure, so when you're serving someone for their pleasure, then obviously you're going to serve them what they want. You know, it's like the old joke about the communist is preaching. And he says, comrades, after the revolution, we're all going to have strawberries and cream. And the little Jew says, what if I don't like strawberries and cream? The communist says, after the revolution, you better like strawberries and cream. <laughs> right. right. So... The point is, when we're serving Hashem, it's for Him. We're giving Him what He wants from us. Not what we want to give Him, but what He wants to get from us. So, um, when we understand that, then we also, it, it's that interesting paradox of, well, if right now, while this is the Avaidah, while this is the work, I have to be focused on it, like there's nothing else in the world, and not even a possibility for anything else in the world. And the paradox is, at the same time, as soon as I get the word, change your avoda, change your work, okay, I change it. In other words, when I become attached to the service that I'm doing, not only is that just another attachment that I should have shed along with all the other attachments that I've been trying to let go of, it's actually the worst attachment. And I'll tell you why because it's got a holy excuse. It's jihad, it's a holy war, right? Because now I've got, uh, presumably, in my own mind at least, I have God co-signing the fact that I cannot waver from this path. Well, when that's no longer the path, it's time to change and to change gracefully. We spoke about it last night, about the Akedah, about 
Abraham sacrificing Isaac. You know, it was about abandoning your life's work, particularly a, a holy life's work, a life's work dedicated to God and God wanting to make sure that even though you have been doing something holy and doing something for God your whole life, you're ready to walk away from it when asked to do so. Otherwise, you're proving that you haven't been doing it for God, have you? Right? I mean, I don't want to repeat everything I said last night, but we, we spoke about the fact that Abraham spent his entire life being God's PR man, you know, pumping mon monotheism. And then in the end, if he's going to sacrifice his kid, it's like, okay, now you're just like uh, another pagan, just like us. It's the biggest chil Hashem. It's the biggest uh, scandal, right? And he's going to, everything he did for God is going to be lost. And yet, God didn't actually want him to, to slaughter Isaac, but he wanted, to, he wanted Abraham to show that he was ready even to abandon what he had been doing for God, right? And that's how you really show that it was for God. Because at the end, if you say, I baked you a cake, but then you don't let the person who you made it for eat it. <laughs> no, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Too beautiful. I baked you a cake, but please don't eat it. <laughs> right? God, I made this beautiful work called this, this repaired life. I took, I salvaged this life from dysfunction and I healed it and I repaired it. And look, it's such a thing of beauty. And, you know, if God says, okay, well, drop it, let it break again. Oh, <laughs> no, no, God. All right, so then who did you do it for, right? Um, now, I, I want to look at another question that we, that we got in, because I think it's related to this idea that I'm speaking about right now. Um, someone's writing here, yeah. I remain with this question. Um, pri uh, primary point of self-improvement of Vedas Hashem is giving over our will to God's will to the point of surrendering self and self-effacement. People who are struggling with emotional health often misunderstand this in the name of making God's will their own. We negate the self entirely and never actually have a sufficiently developed healthy sense of self to give up. As an example, I rejoice when my son tells me his preferences in food, his jealousy, his anger. I rejoice because he's being a self. He's showing aspects of being human, which I never had. I heard in your lecture that some of us involved in self-improvement and healing are just perpetuating service of self rather than service of God. My question remains, doesn't there have to be a self first to give God? What if that was not allowed to develop? like children who are never allowed to know their own feelings, likes, dislikes. Telling them to surrender their will to God is easy. There is no will. <laughs> exactly. First, they need to find their will. Talks like these are very confusing without that clarification. Okay, well, thank you for writing that. And yes, let us, to the contrary, let us, let us clarify. Absolutely, let us clarify here. Um, you say very good. Zuckst gut. Um, I mean, as you said, you have to have a self in order to surrender the self. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, we spoke about, uh, we, uh, we spoke an awful lot last night about uh, Bittel. Um, you know, I was once, I was giving a talk in uh, Texas and I had mentioned Bittel. I mean, I like Bittel. Bittel is, you know, one of my favorite subjects. And uh, afterwards, some lady comes over to me and she says to me, Bittul. And I'm like, okay, yeah, Bittul. You know, because I, I pronounce it Bittul, you know, Ashkenazi Kavara. But Bittul, that's like the, you know, Havarat Sephardit, you know, Bittul, right? The emphasis on the second syllable <clears throat> or on the last syllable so i said yeah be tool yeah you could say it that way she says no no no, be tool i'm like yeah be tool be tool yeah be tool right she says no no, no. be tool be tool be tool uh, what what is she saying that i'm not you know what does she want me to hear that i'm not hearing so i, I said yeah I, I, that's that's, another, that's also a way to pronounce it so she says be tool be a tool. Be a tool of Hashem. Bam. 
wow <laughs> that was so great because i realized that's exactly what bittel means bittel means be a tool of hashem be a tool of hashem now for the sake of god's glory i want god to have a nice tool I want him to have the best tool. In fact, the whole purpose of self-improvement was because I don't belong to me. Trust me. If I belonged to me, you know what I would do with me? I'd walk through the door and throw myself on the couch. <laughs> you know. But if you belong to Hashem, then there's a whole other responsibility. And uh, if you are Hashem's tool, then you got to take care of Hashem's tool. So yeah, definitely when we speak about bittel, surrender, humility, we are not talking about shattered self-esteem. That for sure not. And we're not talking about, this is a little bit different, but um, lack of self-concept. No, what we're talking about is whatever self-concept you have, you realize it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. Um, this is especially important after the healing begins. You know, we spoke about last night how we go from Passover to Shavuos, right? In 49 days, you go from where you have to have ego death, you have to be matzah, you have to be flat. And after 49 days of working on yourself, now you get to be a puffy loaf of bread that's a holy sacrifice that's brought in the holy temple, right? The, the puffiness represents the ego, a healthy, robust ego. So, um, you know, after the healing, when you do have a strong sense of self, this becomes a, a, a especially important because obviously you can fall in a trap where you go back to self-will. So how, how are we supposed to uh, not allow our blessings to cause us to lose our blessings? Obviously, when we're, when we're humble, we, you know, an empty vessel is able to receive. But uh, how do we remain humble even when things are going good? So, you know, there's an interesting... Uh, there's a story, an interesting story in the Gemara, in the Talmud. It says Rabbi Yechanan was very beautiful. And as such, he would sit in front of the mikveh, the women's mikveh. I'm going to say, uh, that's, that's very suspicious. No, he was, he was a holy person. He did it because when the women would see him, he wasn't doing it that he should look at the women. He was doing it that the women should look at him that he was beautiful, and when they would see him and have an impression of his beautiful uh, appearance in their mind, then when they would go home and uh, be with their husbands, so then they would have beautiful children. Anyways, so somebody came, they, they criticized him about it, but not for the reasons you would think. Again, it, there was nothing like at all inappropriate about it. It was totally, you know, he's doing something very, very noble. But somebody criticized him nonetheless, but for a totally different reason. They said to him, Ein Hura. Aren't you afraid of attracting an evil eye? You know, you're showing off your beauty, and uh, you're gonna you're gonna arouse somebody's jealousy, and uh, you're gonna get an ayin hara. So he says, "I'm not worried about ayin hara, about evil eye, because I'm a descendant of uh, Yosef, of Joseph, because I'm from uh, Bnei Ephraim, a descendant of uh, Ephraim, who's one of the sons of Yosef." And regarding them. Yankovino, Jacob, our father, gave the blessing of Yidgu Lareiv. Yidgu Lareiv means they should multiply like fish. Um, you know, they should multi multiply like fish. So what does it mean they should multiply like fish? Rashi actually even says this in the, in the commentary there on, on, on the verse. In uh, Parshish Vayechi, at the end of, uh, of Sefer Bereshis, the book of uh, Genesis, he says there, that uh, the ayin hara doesn't rule over the, the fish so uh, because they're down in the water. So there, there are two ways of reading that. Sid, this explains. There's two ways of reading that. One way of reading that is fish are not harmed by the evil eye. They're immune to the evil eye because they're down in the water. 
What does that mean? Keep a low profile, right? Keep your head down. Don't attract attention. And no evil eye. Like a fish who's hidden under the water. That's one way of understanding it. And, and, and that means that basically, it, let's say you came back from a lot of challenge and you were able to put your life back together for Hashem. Again, we're, we're, we're emphasizing that, we're doing this for Hashem. But you were able to put your life back together and you are seeing blessing in your life and you are seeing success in certain areas. So maybe you need to like be very, very uh, secretive about it because you don't want to, uh, you know, appear arrogant. Even if you're not, but you don't want to appear it. You don't want to attract attention, and uh, you know you'll, you'll draw negative energy. God forbid. That's one inter interpretation. The other interpretation is, no, the fish is immune to the evil eye because he's down in the water. Yeah, that's what we said. No, 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 because he's down in the water. Get it? No. The fish cannot live out of the water. Like the parable of Rabbi Akiva. Remember when the Romans made it illegal to learn Torah? And Rabbi Akiva continued learning. And someone said, why are you doing that? You're going to get killed. And he told the parable. He said, you know, once there was a fish and uh, swimming in the water, a fox came along and said, fish, it's dangerous in the water because the fishermen have their nets spread out to catch you. Come out of the water and come up on dry land with me, the fox says. Right? The fox was trying to catch the fish, trying to con him. So the fish says to the fox, foolish fox, I mean, they say that you're so clever. You're not. Because you would know that I can't live outside of the water. The water is my life. Yes, I'm in danger here. The fishermen have cast their nets. But if I come out of the water, which is the place of my life, I'll be even more danger. And that's what Rabbi Akiva said. Torah is the place of my life. If I come out of that, I'm not going to be in less danger. I'll only be in more danger. Right? A fish is in the water. A fish is constantly in the place from whence it derives its life. When you are a fish, a fish means that you realize that you are completely, uh, 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 you are completely uh, um, dependent, like a fish is dependent on water. You are completely dependent upon Hashem. Not just that Hashem is bigger than you, and therefore you have to go to Him from time to time to get what you need. But literally every single second, you are dependent on Hashem. Like a fish is dependent, cannot live outside of the water for a moment. When you realize this, when you have that attitude, that there's no separation, there cannot be separation. I'm dependent every single second. Even though I have blessings in my life, even though I have success in my life, I'm still dependent on God every single second. Ah, now don't worry about any evil eye. Because you don't even think that the stuff that you have is really yours. You don't really think it's really yours. And you're right, it's not really yours. First of all, God helped you do it. You couldn't do anything without him. Second of all, it belongs to him. He can come take it away like we were talking about. And you have to be willing to give it to him and not tell him, oh, I worked so hard on this beautiful life I built for you. Don't take it away. No, you have to be ready with joy to release it to him if he wants to start you all over again from a new bottom. So when you have a fish attitude, that means that even when I have an act of life, even when I have stuff going on in my life, it's not my life. It doesn't belong to me. Remember we talked about last night, the parable at the end about the $20, the car, the job, the house, and the, the wife and the kids? Yeah, I have a life, but it's not mine. It's Hashem's life that he's letting me, not letting me, ordering me to use the way he wants it to be used. So sense of self is not a contradiction at all to surrender. 
Sense of self is not a contradiction at all to uh, Bittel. Surrender and Bittel, in fact, are even more enhanced, magnified, the greater sense of self you have because you're giving up more. You are acknowledging that Hashem has this, 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 this life that is full, that is, that is uh, rich, and it's all his. So it's not about being an empty person who has no uh, feelings, who has no preferences, who has no uh, desires. It's about realizing that you don't have autonomous claim to any of it. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, I was going to mention something else in connection to that idea, but uh, I don't recall what it is, so let's move on. I see questions, many questions that came in, and, and let's see if we can get to them. But I want to continue with the questions that uh, came in from the email. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue with the next thing I wanted to say related to this. Can't remember. Okay. Question that came in, very, very good question. In fact, this question, various iterations of this question, I got several people asking this question, but this is the one that I'm, that I'm reading. What would you tell someone who's not at rock bottom but working at changing? It is indeed harder. Um, I've noticed with people that I coach that they do better at changing when they hit rock bottom. Okay. Um, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Remember last night, I said that bottom is relative. So maybe I didn't elaborate sufficiently, but I said that bottom is a relative uh, term and that no two people have the same, objectively, the same bottom. Let me, let me elaborate a little bit more. Probably I should have. Because bottom is a relative term, therefore, not only do no two people have the same bottom, but it's not set in stone. It's not a fixed thing what your bottom is going to be. And therefore, we can raise the bottom, so to speak. We need bottom. We must hit bottom. But bottom can be raised. It can be higher. Bottom just means when I realize I can't do this alone. Bottom just means that it's not that I'm not good enough or smart enough. It's not that I don't care enough. It's not that I'm not a decent person. I'm all of those things and, and more. And none of it is sufficient. I cannot do this thing. Now, if your life falls apart, then it's pretty clear then it's pretty clear. Although, <laughs> I know plenty of people whose lives fell apart multiple times and we're still, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, trying another, uh, another scheme, how to insist that their life was not yet unmanageable. But at any rate, be, a person who is not facing crisis can also find within themselves powerlessness and the need for surrender. However, I will be transparent in saying that it requires a lot more work. If you understand the nature of reality, if you understand that created existence 
is not absolute. Okay, now I'm getting philosophical. Yeah, what do you want from me? I'm a Hasidic rabbi. I teach Hasidus. We're going to do a little mysticism. Sue me. 30 seconds of it. The nature of uh, creation is that it wasn't always here. It's not eternal. What we call something was once nothing. And something, the real something with a capital S, had to put it here. God is absolute existence. Everything in creation, including us, is relative existence or conditional existence. Conditional upon what? Conditional upon the creator forcing us into existence. So we don't exist on our own. We have nothing. Not just we have no life, we have no existence. If God would stop creating us this second, we would not only stop living, we would stop existing. In fact, we would stop existing even retroactively in the past because we would lose everything about ourselves, even our history. So if you are able to meditate on these truths, on the ontological dependence of everything upon the absolute one, then you will be able to find your dependence. You will be able to find your dependence upon Hashem. Most of us come to this because of crisis, because life is falling apart, I can't manage life, and therefore I become open to the possibility of powerlessness. However, if you are willing to do this philosophically, and reach this conclusion logically as a thought experiment and, and, and realize the truth of it without having to go through pain, then yes, you could surrender even when life is, is stable and good and, 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 and pleasant and easy, if there is such a person who has such a life. But in theory, if somebody had such a life, if anyone out there had such a life, they could just simply, they could reach a level of surrender just by realizing that by... By definition, all of us are completely dependent upon Hashem. Oh, and that's what I was talking about before, about about the fish. The fish realizing that it is constantly dependent upon its life source. You can't walk out of the water for a little bit and then, you know, go back in. We can't divorce ourselves from God for one endeavor or for one uh, you know, God, you know what? I got some stuff to do right now that I think I can cover on my own, and I'll come back and check in on you when there's stuff that I can't cover. No. There's no existence. We do not exist without him. So you could reach that philosophically. It's just obviously um, much more much more difficult. Um... Let's look at another. Okay. I was at a Frum 12 step group. I'm, I'm going to give commentary, and I'm going to assume that means a 12 step group where there's a lot of Frum people. Okay. I was at a Frum 12 step group. <clears throat> By the way, Frum 12 step groups, some of them are great, but a lot of them, nobody can get past the first three steps because the first three, three steps are about God. And all these people with yeshiva training, they just, they go in circles with their, you know, yeshiva arguments about God. It's like, <laughs> I, I tell from people a lot of times, like, please just keep it simple. You know, don't, don't, don't tell me what you heard about God in yeshiva. Obviously it wasn't working, you know. Okay. I was at a from 12 step group and after a woman shared, after reading, a woman shared, I'm not powerless over my actions, just over my thoughts and feelings. Okay. So basically she was saying something like to, um, so I don't want to say against the program because I'm not like here to be the police, but uh, she was, she was qualifying the fact that, look, 
program is about powerlessness, right? We admitted we were powerless. That's the first step. And she was saying, I'm not powerless over my actions. She was being medayic. I'm using the yeshiva term. She was being medayic. I, I with the thumb. I'm not powerless over my actions, just over my thoughts and feelings. Okay. She was parroting what we were all taught. All the other women continued in her way, meaning they were like, Cool. That's I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that too. Then one brave woman said, "I do feel powerless over my actions, and I surrender to God." This woman personified to me what goodness lies in the twelve steps, and how my own healing can move forward if I truly surrender my dysfunction and issues to God instead of sitting in self blame and self hate at my dysfunction and my issues. But of course, I also wonder if this is the truth and how it fits with from education. Okay. So basically, your experience tells you this is true, but your Torah learning doesn't necessarily, you can't find sources for it to back it up. Um, so you want to talk about that. First of all, I think it's funny that this person wanted to say, I'm powerless over my actions, just not over my thoughts and my feelings. Because according to Tanya, thoughts are actions. <laughs> In Tanya, you have three uh, levushim, three garments of the soul. Action, speech, and thought. Yeah, thought is a behavior, albeit a behavior that we engage in in our own head, but it's a behavior. You know, I'll give you a perfect illustration of it. Like, think the times tables right now. Go ahead, think the times tables. You don't have to do fancy ones like 11 times 12. Nobody can hear you. Just think it. Okay, fine. You're doing it right now? Okay, good. All right. I feel like Dora the Explorer. <laughs> anyway, um, so were you thinking the times tables just uh, 10 seconds ago when I told you to do it? Yeah. Okay, good. Were you thinking the times tables 10 minutes ago? No. But did you know the times tables 10 minutes ago? Yeah, you probably knew them 10 years ago. And that's my point, that thought is a behavior. It's something that has a beginning, it has an end, a duration, it's an activity. You start and you stop. Um, and by the way, not to seize upon words, but when I said, are you doing it? Are you doing it? I used the word doing to describe thinking, and you were comfortable with that. Because thought is a behavior. So if she wants to say and be mediac, I'm only powerless over my actions, but not my thoughts and feelings. I would say, well, according to Tanya, <laughs> your, your thoughts are actions. And whatever responsibility you have over your actions, you have the same responsibility over your thoughts. Okay, now I'm making trouble. But sometimes we do that. We make the question even bigger before we answer. What does it mean? I'm powerless over anything. Obviously, I have free will. That's a, a basic truth. First of all, powerlessness, powerlessness means that even if I choose the behaviors I want to choose, I'm powerless over the outcomes. So yeah, I can choose an action but I have no guarantee what results that action will lead to. I can shoot the arrow. I don't know where it's going to land. So that, that's first of all. And that, that's very easy to, to grasp that concept. But I'm going to give you another answer as well because you're going to say, well, I don't think that's really what it means. When, uh, when it says, you know, in, a, in the 12 steps, when it talks about being powerless, I think it means power, powerless over our actions, over choosing our actions. So, um, you know, I don't want to turn this into a webinar about recovery. And maybe we need to do a webinar just about recovery. I don't know if people are interested in that. Let me know. I generally stay away from it because I've found 
that the subject is so misunderstood. I don't even have, I just don't have the wherewithal to talk about the subject. So I actually don't speak about recovery very often at all, at least not on purpose, but I guess I am now. And I don't want to talk about it too much longer here in, in this webinar, which is not supposed to be limited to recovery. But let's put it like this. If you're going to talk about a loss of choice, so let's put it like this. Powerlessness, as far as, um, you know, a first step admission of powerlessness, can mean a couple of things. In addition to what I said before, that we don't control outcomes. It can mean that once I begin to let's use the example of drinking because the first 12 step program was AA. Okay. But it could be anything. Once I eat my trigger foods, once I start lusting, right? Whatever it is, once I make a bet, now I have unleashed something that is going to have its way with me. So my powerlessness actually followed a choice. In fact, it was the result of a choice. I chose to think that I can drink or lust or bet or eat my trigger foods with impunity, like a gentleman in moderation. And that part was the choice. But then after I did it, I lost choice. Like I once heard an old timer say, Go eat a, a, a bottle of x lax and then will yourself not to run to the bathroom, right? It has nothing to do with free choice. But another way to explain it, yet another way, the powerlessness, is that um, it's practical powerlessness. It's practice it it's effective powerlessness in other words that if i don't keep myself spiritually fit if i'm spiritually sick then i do not have access to my power of choice right so if i allow myself to become spiritually sick and i allow the obsession of the mind to overtake me so I'm obviously not going to be making good choices. So in effect, it's as if I have lost my power of choice. That's another way of explaining it. But now I've given you three ways of explaining powerlessness, which uh, I think are suitable for any uh, religious Jew. And I also think they're true and in line with, with the program. Okay. Um, so that's that. Still have more questions. Many, many more questions here to go through. And new questions are coming in as we speak. And I apologize. There are texts here. I'm not text chats. There's chats and there's questions. And there's two places where I have to look where there's comments coming in. Um, I just can't keep up. Sorry about that. Um, let me let me move on to something else I want to talk about. Um, actually, it was a question. This is also a question. Let me go to that. Where is it? Where is it? Okay, there it is. In the healing world, there is a talk of embracing the shadow self and finding the good there. In trying to understand this within the realm of Torah, I wonder if this is parallel to converting the Yetzirah to the Yetzirah. Is there a limit to how much of the shadow side we can embrace? 
is my embracing all is my embracing of all, of all of it problematic? Do we take the concept of kodesh and choil, which I'll translate kodesh means holy, choil means profane? Do I take the concept of kodesh and choil to mean some shadow parts are not embraceable, meaning they are profane and therefore off limits? Okay, that's a wonderful question. Now, I am going to perhaps surprise you by telling you that I've heard people use this term, but I know nothing about it. Uh, I know. Everybody thinks that I know all the secular stuff, and I don't. I, I, I really don't. My knowledge of psychology, of secular psychology, is, I've said this before in public, it, 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 and I've, I've been so open about it. Anyone who doesn't get it yet is just, you know, like, my knowledge of secular psychology is limited to whatever books my father's old Gesundheit had lying around the house when I was a kid. Okay? That's, that's my extent of my knowledge. However, you're asking me about, you know, the shadow self in, uh, you know, in Torah, and is it compatible with Torah? So I'll tell you a story about the shadow self. A Hasidic story and a Hasidic explanation as well. It's all about the shadow self. Uh, the, and this is a story that the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, told in a Sikha, and then the Rebbe repeated this the same story, and, and analyzed it. And I'll give you a little bit of the Rebbe's analysis of the story. The story was about the third Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek. Oh, here we go. See there? Second. There you go. See there. This picture? The, the Rebbe wearing white? Right there over my shoulder? Where? Where? That's the Tzemach Tzedek. Okay. So the story is like this. The Tzemach Tzedek used to uh, say a maimer, a Hasidic discourse, specifically for working men, simple Jews, not scholars. I mean, the Tzemach Tzedek was, would also say discourses to, to the scholars as well. But he had a special thing where on the market day, when all the merchants would come to town for the market, he would meet in the shul, and he would give them a discourse before dawn. Why before dawn? Because as soon as the sun comes up, you got to get to the market. You got to sell. You know, if you don't merchandise at dawn, someone else is going to sell it, and uh, you know you're going to be out of luck all day. So it was very interesting. You can imagine this, this. Uh, you know, it's before dawn. Shul is full of these working guys who got up before dawn, simple Jews who are ready to go work, and the Tzemach Tzedek is saying this just for them. Just a striking image. Anyways, that's not even what the story is about. The story is that the, the Tzemach Tzedek was saying the Maimer, the discourse, and there was a Chayzer. A Chayzer is the, like, the oral scribe. He's the one who memorizes what the Rebbe said and then writes it down later so that uh, we can have it preserved. So the Tzemach Tzedek scribe in this case was a chassid by the name of Rashbatz. Rashbatz is an acronym for Reb Shmuel Betzalo. There's a lot of interesting stories about the life of Rashbatz. But uh, at any rate, Rashbatz was the chaser. He was the one who was supposed to sing to the Rebbe, so he was standing pretty close. Uh, the Tzemach Tzedek was sitting at a table, and I told you it was before dawn, so there was a candle in the room, right, this is before electric lights, candle in the room for light, and the Rashbatz was standing in front of the candle in such a way that his shadow was projected onto the Tzemach Tzedek. Okay, so you picture this, the Tzemach Tzedek is sitting there, saying this discourse, the Chayzer, the one who's the oral scribe, is standing nearby between the Tzemach Tzedek and the candle. And so the shadow of this Chayzer, of this person, the, the, 
is projected onto the Tzemach Tzad. So at that moment, <clears throat> the Rashbat said that he thought to himself that uh, I should probably move because uh, <laughs> I'm putting a shadow on the Rebbe. And then he thought to himself, so this is all in his mind, he thought to himself, um, well, what? He's the Rebbe. He can handle it. He can deal with my shadow. <laughs> you understand? He, this is not only a literal shadow. The Shbats was the Chayzer. He was someone who was capable of memorizing and then transmitting the Chassidus of the Tzemach Tzedek was a very deep person. So he, all of the, this, this internal dialogue he's having with himself all on, a, on a mystical level as well. In other words, I'm projecting my shadow onto the Rebbe. But maybe I don't have to worry about that because the Rebbe is the Rebbe here with my shadow, right? What do I have to take away my shadow for? And uh, as he thought that, the Tzemach stopped in the middle of the discourse and all of a sudden said, a shotan, that means a shadow in Yiddish, a shot in his chayshich. Un chayshich can be nit maile zayn. Shadow is darkness. And the shadow and, and darkness cannot be elevated. Very interesting. Shadow is darkness. And uh, darkness cannot be elevated. It's a, it's a cryptic. What does it mean darkness cannot be elevated? I mean, the question that was written here, whoever wrote in the question, they said, is this what's meant by transforming the Yitzhah Hara into the Yitzhah Toiv? And, you know, the inclination being transformed into the, to the good inclination. And yeah, there is such a concept. Obviously, we know that we can transform the darkness. Or the idea of of Zdainus Nasalei Kizachias, right? That of sin, even his willful sin, that he did it on purpose and he enjoyed it, right? But later on, when he does real tshuva, real, real, real return, you know, out of the depths of his heart and out of love for God, not only can he erase that past, but better than erasing it, he can turn that darkness into light. He can turn that negativity into a springboard for extra sensitivity and extra vigilant relationship with God. So clearly there's an idea of what we call ishapcha, of transformation. Of, of darkness to light. So what was the Tzemach Tzedek saying? That shadow is dark and you can't, you can't elevate dark. So remember before that everything's paradox, right? That's why I told you, I'm a Gemini. I was born in the third month, in the month of Sivan, the month of the twins. Everything's paradox in Torah. Is it this or is it this? You need a third hand because it's this. There are two ways of looking at Cheshach. Um, it's actually a, a discussion, a philosophical discussion in, in Judaism, in the classic uh, sources. Is darkness a creation just like light is a creation? Or is darkness merely the absence of the creation called light? A shadow is where you're blocking, so it's the absence of light. A darkness that is the absence of something, you can't elevate it because there's nothing there. It's the absence of something. It's not a something, it's nothing. So how are you going to elevate it? It's not that, oh, it's so powerful it's so sweet so it's so creepy that oh we dare not try no it's it's nothing there's nothing to it so there's nothing to work with then there's another way of looking at darkness which is darkness is something it is an entity it's darkness it's a thing called darkness and that we can elevate what does that mean? It means that the lack of something is also a lack of potential, good or bad. But the presence of something, even something bad, 
has potential even to be good. That's always why, you know, in, in Exodus, we talk about uh, the worst thing is apathy. The worst yeah. apathy, right? A Amalek, the archetypical enemy, the arch enemy of the Jewish people. A Amalek, what did he do? He cooled you off. Cooled you off on the way. Coming out of Egypt, when you were victorious, triumphant, he cooled you off. He cooled your ardor. So, I have something, there's nothing to work with. But passion, even negative pa passion, can be channeled. So that's what we can work with. Another way of putting it, that Rebbe says this, is that there, there are two kinds of Aveda. So, and this is... This is David Amalek, King David, uses this formulation in his in his Tilim, in his Psalms. Sumera vase tev. Away or turn away from evil and do good. And generally speaking, in Aveda, in the work, there is what we need to turn away from, like the negation of something. And then there's what we want to work toward, what we're going to, right? That which is where we're proactively pursuing through our, you know, usually, uh, you know, it means by acts of goodness and kindness. The neshama, the soul, did come down to this world merely to avoid evil. And I'll give you the most simple proof. Because if the soul wants to avoid evil... <laughs> or let me reformulate that. If God's intent was that the soul should avoid evil, then God should have the soul up there where there is none, where there is no evil. So the fact that the soul was sent down here where there is evil can't be just to avoid it because to avoid it could have done it up there. What the soul was sent down here for is not sumera, but asetoiv, not the negation of negativity. That sounds like a double negative. But the uh, pursuit of positivity. Oh, so then why is there negativity? Why? This is what the Rebbe explains. The negativity exists so that the good that you do can be yours. That it can be yours. When Hashem gets your mitzvahs, He wants them to be your mitzvahs that you're giving to Him. Not His mitzvahs that He's giving to Himself. And the only way they can be yours is if you had to work for them. So the negativity <clears throat> only exists in order to enhance the quality of the positivity. And in that sense, it has no inherent value. This is the key piece here. The negativity itself has no inherent value. It, it's only there to enhance the value of the positivity by making positivity something you have to work harder to attain. Since the negativity has no inherent value, what's the other side of that same coin? It can be repurposed and reclaimed and brought over in order to have positive value. Not its own value, but the value that it gives the side of good. When is that? Only when there's something to be brought over. When there's something there of substance to bring over. In other words, if there's some type of negative drift and you can take that drive and redirect it to the good, now you're working with something. Now something's been accomplished. But if it's merely darkness in the sense of absence of something, then there's nothing to work with. There's nothing to bring over to the good side.
So to put it in, in, in very simple terms, the empty places, those those vacant hallways of our of our insides, they have no redeeming value. They're just places to get lost in and uh, don't go there. But the twists of character, and I'm going to use a word in its literal sense here, the perversity, perversion literally means twisted in the wrong way. That stuff you can work with. It can be repurposed and reclaimed. And that indeed is the idea of a second Yetzir Toiv, which is a refurbished Yetzir Hara. You take the evil inclination, I mean, ultimately in the perfect sense, we're talking about a tzaddik who does that, who has two inclinations, one which is a regular uh, a regular good inclination, the other one is what they call aftermarket. Uh, he took, a, he took a, an evil inclination, he turned it into a second good inclination. Okay, so in very, very practical terms, we can find the negativity that's being misused and reclaim it for God and use it properly. And in fact, here, let me take it even further. What we do find when we surrender our qualities to God, when we surrender our personality to God, what we find is that all of our character defects were really our character assets. They're one and the same. You know where you see this most obvious, obviously, that our character defects are identical with our character assets? In uh, marriage problems when spouse of contempt for each other. And you ask them, well, what don't you like about him or what don't you like about her? And uh, you know what what will always happen every single time. So you let them tell you the reasons. Well, you know, she's she's a uh, shit. She and she says, well, you know, he's controlling. And then, you know, don't ask them anymore about that. You distract them by letting them talk because people talk for as long as you let them. And then after they've forgotten what they told you at the beginning, you, you ask them. So listen, I mean, at one time you were in love. When you fell in love, what was the quality that attracted you to your spouse? So he says, you know, she was fun loving. <laughs> He said she was an airhead. Now he's telling you when he fell in love with her, she was fun loving. And then you ask her, what, 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 what did you fall in love with about him? Well, you know, he's confident, right? She said, controlling. Now he's controlling. But back then when she fell in love with him, that was called confident. It's not just the distortion that they're giving it. There's actually truth to it. All of our greatest character defects are are character assets. They're one and the same. We develop actions at a young age, generally to avoid family fights. <laughs> I'm just saying, most people were not raised by wolves. They were raised by families. And most families have dysfunction. So your early life adaptations are all about how you dealt with the dysfunction in your home, right? So learn these adaptations. So some of us learned how to be funny, to diffuse the tension. Some of us learned how to be tough, to stand up for ourselves, right? You want to bark at me? I'll bark louder, right? Others, others of us learned, you know, that uh, go hide, make yourself invisible. That's, that, that's what seems to work. Some learn to be the, uh, the diplomat, you know, to run and try to make peace between whoever is fighting, right? And we learn these adaptations at a very young age, and they become our personalities. And 
we can't we get to a point where we cannot even imagine ourselves without these characteristics now what happens is these same adaptations they end up becoming uh they consume us and in fact we were talking about free will before in a certain way they kind of diminish free will i don't i don't mean on a, on a philosophical level that they take Bechira away. But what I mean is, look, when you get really used to using certain tools, or even one tool, you know, when you have a toolkit for living with one or two or three tools in your toolkit, right, you only have a few songs in your repertoire. So it's not that you don't have the choice to do something out of the box, things different than your repertoire, but it's highly unlikely because this is what I do. This is what I do. And because this is what I do, I'm actually really good at it, right? So it's my strong Also, because this is what I do, it becomes my undoing. It becomes that thing that drives people away from me. It becomes that thing that, that, that consumes life and, and, and takes on you know, a, a life of its own and, 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 and it drives a wedge between me and other people. But it's one quality. When we heal and we surrender and we give up our personalities, what that means is I am willing. Let's say my adaptation is being funny. I'm willing to be naked. My humor was my armor. But you know what? That armor is now causing damage in my life. It's a blockage from relationships. I need to surrender it. And I'm accepting now in this act of surrender that if God never wants me to make another joke, again, I accept that I'm naked. I don't have my armor anymore. I don't have my adaptation. I'm giving it up. And you have to be sincere about that surrender. Like the parable last night about the guy giving up the, the $20, the car, the job, the house, the wife, the kids. What happens is that once you've given it up and it's not yours anymore, well, if it's not yours, who are you to say how it's to be used? Maybe God will back in your lap and say, now I want you to use it for me. What are you supposed to tell God? God, please, that's my trigger. No, no, that's not your trigger. Doing it as an adaptation, doing it as a defense mechanism, doing it as a compulsion or as a habit, doing it because you think that's what you need to do in order to survive, that's the trigger. But now that you've realized you can give it up and you won't die, I can give up this quality, my go-to thing, my go-to thing. I'm giving it up and I'm not going to die because God is taking care of me, not me. I don't take care of me. God takes care of me. And now God says, hey, you know that? You're pretty good at being funny. Now do it for me. You can tell when people are arrested in the process of the work because they've realized that all the stuff they have needs to go, they need to give it up, but they haven't yet received it back in a healthy form. When do you know that you really have done the work when you're able to go back to those same character traits and use them in a sober way, in a healthy way. Now, I got to clarify what I mean. Although this was not supposed to be about recovery, I know I have a lot of recovery people listening, and <laughs> there's got to be at least one addict out there saying, oh, he said I can use again in moderation. No, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. I said, your character flaws 
I'm not talking about using. I'm not talking about, <laughs> no. I'm talking about your character flaws, your defects of character. Those were all just distortions. They were distortions. They are warped versions of things that have a positive. And like we are talking about before, the darkness that can be reclaimed and repurposed is the misappropriation or the mischanneling of an energy. And not only it can be reclaimed and repurposed, it has to be. It has to be. So it's not about, oh, well, when will I get to make jokes again? No. If God wants me to never make jokes again, I've given it up. I'll never make jokes again. But, I'm, but if I'm fully healed, what it means is I can now do that thing that I became great at. And I did. I became great at it, right? I can now do that thing not because my ego is telling me if I don't do it, I'll die. Because I know even if I don't do it, I won't die. I'm okay. God has me. I'm doing that thing as a gift to God. So the same behavior, the same category of behavior, you know, I gave the example of making jokes. Fill in the blank, whatever it is that you do. Whatever it is that you do. I said different examples of ways that kids avoid family fights. Some, some people make jokes. Some people try to make peace. Some people fight back. Some people go hide. Okay, let's say you're those in hides. If the only way that you can respond to any stress is hiding, and it's as if you have no choice because that's your only tool, and if you don't do it, you're going to die, that's, that's a character defect. But when you've given that up and you've realized, you know what, next time there's stress, I'm not going to go hide. And I won't die because God's taking care of me. And now you can do that. Now, when God requires you to hide, <laughs> you know, sometimes you need, to, you need to hide, right? I don't mean physically in the corner. I mean, lay low, be quiet, don't draw attention. When you can do that in service of God, instead of, you know, adaptation, you've brought full healing to that quality. Okay. I want to talk about I want to talk about a lot of other things. Uh, I'm just trying to budget my time. I have a lot of questions left. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I got to fix it at this point, you know. We, got it. we don't have that much time, about 15 minutes left. Um, I got a lot of questions about marriage, about relationships. I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to sum them all up. I got various different uh, variations marriage questions, bad marriage, uh, currently bad or people who were in a bad marriage they're out of it but they don't know if they're healed enough to to get remarried and okay so let, let's let's talk a little bit about this and then there was also a question maybe i'll relate to that question somebody wrote in and asked about you know last night i said that wherever you're feeling pain that's where you need to pay attention to your own ego and you know reel it back in reduce it well, what if somebody's mistreating you, you know, on them, right? Like, what if you're in a prolonged relationship where you're, you're continuously exposed to this mistreatment? So the pain, is, is that a reflection on you? Maybe it's a reflection on... Okay, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, first of all, I, I think I said very clearly last night that 
when I'm examining the pain that I have in my relationships, this is not absolving the other party of any guilt. Okay, if they've mistreated me, uh, God will know that, and God will deal with it. I don't have to deal with it. Thank God. I'm I'm not involved in God's uh, judicial system where I have to make sure that people who victimize me get their comeuppance. Thank God, because, you know, I've given them enough of my headspace. I'm not going to give them more by tracking them and being their parole officer. Um, I said that last time. Okay. Um, but when I experience pain in my relationships, yeah, of course, of course I have to take that as very, very important message for me about my own growth. Of course I do. Um, is it possible the other person is also unhealthy? Yeah, not only possible, probable. Most people are messed up to some degree. And in fact, not only are most people messed up to some degree, God seems to be profoundly adept at matching people together in marriage who are messed up each in exactly the right way to push the buttons of how the other person is messed up. It's, it's, it's uncanny, the way Hashem pulls that up. But he pairs us with people for our growth. In fact, it could even be said that the entire purpose is to allow us to really do the work. As much work as a single person can do, you know, it's just, there's not a resistance. <laughs> there's not enough, there are not enough obstacles to really be uh, engaged in the work until you're in a marriage situation. So what I want to say is experiencing pain in your relationship is, is unavoidable. And it should actually be welcomed because it's an opportunity for growth. Now, if somebody feels unsafe, that's a whole different discussion. Uncomfortable? You know what? I wouldn't tell anybody that they should avoid any amount of discomfort, even profound discomfort. Now, maybe somebody would make a choice that they're in a marriage that's so profoundly uncomfortable that they can't take it anymore, and they, des they decide to leave. And, and again, I wouldn't judge them for that either. But if somebody told me, look, it's really uncomfortable, but I'm embracing the discomfort, I, I would say, go for it. it. Sounds like incredible growth. However, if someone says they're unsafe, that's a different discussion. And, you know, if you're unsafe, that doesn't just mean physical abuse. That, that means all types of uh, lack of security. And, uh, you know, that's a different discussion. And I, and, I, and I wouldn't subject us to a lack of safety. And I'll tell you very simply why. Because, look, we're all, all of this growth is for Hashem. We're doing this all for Hashem. So if you're uncomfortable, you'll grow more for Hashem. But if you're unsafe, now you're jeopardizing, you're putting at risk Hashem's asset. Not really allowed to do that. Um, now, I want to go into another aspect of working on ourselves in terms of relationships. Okay. And this could be another whole webinar. So we could do a whole recovery webinar. We could do a whole webinar. Well, we, I mean, the, about, about relationships. Let me make it very clear, and especially because I, I have less than 10 minutes here. What I'm going to speak about right, right now is not about relationships. It's about how to work on yourself, which is the name of this webinar, this webinar, working yourself. However, I'm going to speak about the aspect of working on yourself, which involves relationships. Okay? So I'm, I'm not talking about relationships. I'm talking about working on yourself, but I'm speaking about the aspect of working on yourself, which involves relationships. Here it is. And in fact, this is one of the questions that I got. I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have time to go look up the questions because uh, I want to end on time. One of the questions was, well, you're talking so much about uh, bittel, 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 about surrender and selflessness, humility. Uh, what about becoming a doormat? Right? What about becoming a doormat and, and being, you know, inviting you know, abuse or mistreatment? So uh, 
Someone wrote in the in the chat webinar on trauma and healing. Yeah, I'll get to the list. Yes, webinar trauma, webinar on relationships, webinar on recovery. Okay, God willing, we'll see. All right. So, uh, what we're we talking about? Yeah, being mistreated. You see, a lot of times people who um, they get to it, they they feel like you know my character defect that I need to work on is people pleasing. I'm a people pleaser. And so therefore what they do, is they say, well, my healing therefore is to become a jerk. And some of them even say that like with, without irony, they say my heal become a jerk and they relish saying no for no good reason. It's like they get a little, hit from that, you know, like almost like bureaucrats, you know, who like relish not being able to accept your form. Like they're happier when you didn't fill out the form properly than when you did. Right. And, and, and there's no way to tell me that that's, that itself is not just that same character defect flipped on its head. Cause it is. People pleasing is not a twist of character or a perversion of character because, because you're doing nice things for people. That's not what makes it toxic. What makes it toxic actually, and this is what we we're talking about before about the character defects, which are adaptations, which are also our strong suits, which we, we surrender to God, but then we get them back and then we can use them not as a compulsion or a defense mechanism or survival uh, skill. We use them at, you know, with, uh, from our own free will as gifts to God. All right. The people pleaser. The problem is not that they're doing nice things. The problem is the compulsion. They feel that they have to, and I'm not using the compulsion in a clinical sense, and I don't use any words in any clinical sense. I'm not a clinician. But they feel they have to do the people-pleasing. They have to be kind, or they will die. Because if I don't get validation, I will die. And I have to get validation. And this is how I do it. Another way of saying that, by the way, is ironically, the person thinks that they're such a giver is not a giver at all. They're the, the ultimate taker because they don't do anything for fun and for free. When they're being kind, it's not altruistic. They're doing it because I have to do it in order to get what I need. If I don't do for people, I won't get what I need. God won't take care of me. I'm on my own over here, and my only skill for living is ingratiating myself with people and getting them to like me, and that's what I got to do, or I'll die. So the the cure, <laughs> the healing, looks like this. When somebody asks me something nice, I can do it from my free will. I can choose it. I don't have to say no to prove that I'm able to say no. I, it's not that doing nice things is a trigger for me, is toxic for me. No. In fact, do it nice, but really do it nice, meaning absolutely no expectation of reward. The toxic part of it wasn't the kindness. The toxic part of it was actually the misappropriation of kindness, manipulatively using kindness as a way of hoping to get your own needs met through other people. But now that our needs are no longer being met through other people, our needs are only being met by God and whatever I get from him is all I need. Now, I get to receive back my kindness, which I'm probably pretty good at. I'm probably put, pretty good at being kind. If I'm, I'm at, I mean, if for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I developed a skill of doing it, albeit in a sick way, but I developed a skill at it, I'm probably pretty good at it. 
when I'm no longer unhealthy, meaning when I'm no longer self-seeking and doing this as a way of getting a payoff, because I don't look for payoffs from people anymore, I'm only looking to serve, I'm only looking to be useful to my maker and to treat his kids right. So I not only get to be kind again, I have to be kind again. I have to be kind. That's one of my ways of serving God. Okay, maybe I'll tell you one last thing. Yeah, one last thing. And uh, this is this is something that really, actually, some someday I want to do at length and really want to develop this more properly. But um, see the <laughs> the Alter Rebbe, the picture of the Alter Rebbe right there. The Alter Rebbe Talmud of the Mezitsh Maggit, he was the student of, of, of the Maggit. And um, so this was in the mid 700s, late 1700s. There was something called the Zibin Yoraka Krieg, the Seven Year War. Seven Year War was a world war because it was fought by all the uh, empires of Europe. Uh, Austria and uh, Prussia and Russia and Spain and England and France, they were all involved in this. And they all had colonies all over the world. It was even fought in North America. In fact, in North America, the Seven Years' War was called the French-Indian War, where um, George Washington was a British general because there was no United States of America yet. Um, so anyways, there was this thing called the Seven Years' War. And... It had just happened when I came to Mezrich. The Mezrich Maggid had a son named Rebbe Avram. They called him the Malach. And it was Rebbe Avram told the Rebbe that Teres of Al-Shemtev, the Al-Shemtev's Derech and Aveda, his, his method of, of serving God, was revealed to the world through the battle plan of Frederick the Great at the Battle of Leuton. Yes, I'm going to say that again. The Magid's son, Rebbe Avram, told the Alter Rebbe Tanya that the path of the Baal was revealed to the world through the battle plan of Frederick the Great of Prussia in the Battle of Leuten. L-E-U-T-H-E-N. Yeah, Leuten. L-E-U-T-H-E-N. You can go Google it. What happened at the Battle of Leuton? So actually, there is a um, there's a document from Hill Paracher, the Chassid, who explains it a little bit more. And uh, I actually, based on this uh, this manuscript from Hill Paracher, I called a professor of military history point to check this and have it explained to me. What did Frederick the Great do differently at Leuton, which is still studied at military academies to this day? The old way of fighting, the way that they fought in, in those days, talking about 1700s, is you would have the battle line, and then imagine like a football game with a line of scrimmage, and you have two teams just lining up facing each other, mano a mano, you know, just like literally one across from the other. And they take their muskets, and they would shoot. Boom, boom. They would just shoot straight at each other, straight across. Boom. Frederick, what he did is he took his whole army, and he converged on one segment of the Austrians at a time. So what does this mean? It means... The old way of working on ourselves was like two guys shooting at the battle line at each other. If I have a problem in this area, so I counteract it with the holy version of that, right? So if I have a, 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 a foreign love, you know, attraction to things of this world, 
So what do I do? I try to directly overpower it by cultivating a love for God. Or if I have, you know, uh, fear, you know, fear of things of this world. So I try to directly counteract it with a fear of God. And you just take whatever it is and you just hit it with the opposite. Two guys shooting across the battle line at each other. Bam, 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 bam. Okay. But when you take your whole army and you bring them up, you pile them up, what is that? That's holistic healing. Instead of just countering dysfunctional with holy chesed or dysfunctional gvura with holy gvura, now you take all your ten soul powers here, all of you from 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 Chochma bin Adas down to Yudat Tveres Netzach Hayyusayit and Malchus, and you ignite them all with a passion to Hashem, and then automatically you take care of the bad guy. Rather than focusing on the problem and feeding into it. Just focus on growing the overall connectedness to God, and automatically the problems will be consumed and fall away, or ideally be transformed, be converted over to good. So we don't we we don't spend an awful lot of time focusing on what's wrong and then targeting it and trying to work on it because what happens is we get drawn into it and focus and then we end up you know they say if you wrestle with a filthy person even if you win you're covered in filth so we don't do that rather what we do is we lift up our all of our soul powers we refine ourselves, we elevate ourselves by connecting ourselves to God through thinking of God first, being obsessed with our connection with God, and then without even having to focus on the character flaws, they start to fall away. In other words, let me just finish this, this webinar similar to the way in which we started. Self-improvement should never become self-obsession. When I'm focused on targeting my negative character traits, that itself is the worst form of self-obsession. And it leaves us dirty and tainted. So instead, focus on self-transcendence, how I can surrender and give my will over to God. What does God need from me? Let me put it in simple English, what those words mean, surrender. And what does God need from me? Not, do, what, what, not what do I feel like doing right now. What is needed from me right now to be a servant? And when I'm focused on that wholeheartedly, The negativity falls away without having to feed into it, without having to give it attention. There's so, so, so much to be said. And I have so many questions here. I see one question that I will answer, which is, do I do private counseling? And the answer is, no, really. This is what I do. This is what I do. Um, if anybody needs to reach me for any reason, I mean, you can contact info at soulwords.org, email info at soulwords.org. And I do have time, I make time every week where I take calls from whoever wants to call and talk about whatever. But um, it's not therapy. It's not counseling. You know, if, if you have a real problem, don't call me. Um, I'm not suited to help you with it, but you know, you want to discuss something in learning or whatever it is, or you want to share an insight with me that you had, you know, by all means. Um, what else can I tell you? So much more, so much more to be said. 
Um, okay, we got to do more of these webinars. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, may we all be able to have a little bit of nachas from this project, this ongoing project that we're engaged in of presenting our best selves to him. Okay, be well, thank you. <laughs>